Um, I am extremely excited and pleased as um, Stefano's primary mentor to introduce you uh, to him today and, and allow him to sort of share his dissertation work with all of you. Um, I'm going to give you just a few minutes of a background about this student because he's a really special person and did some really significant work while he was here at the university. Um, and really, I guess to sort of start with an introduction, um, I got Stefano's uh, CV a number of years ago when I was starting to review candidates for the Water Institute Graduate Fellows Program that I was a faculty member on that was focused on um, watershed decision making in a, in a wetland in Costa Rica that Stefano will tell you about. And when I first saw Stefano's CV, my first question was, why does this person want to come back to get their PhD? Because he's already so accomplished and is already having quite an impact on conservation at kind of an international level. What would he maybe want to get out of a PhD? And when I interviewed Stefano, what he shared with me was that he was really driven to take a deep dive into the dynamics of a local system to really understand the mechanics of a watershed and decision making that happens, you know, at a local level. And only with that insight could he be more effective in the kind of international circles related to wetland policy that he was flying in. And he really felt like he needed a deeper scientific understanding to make greater contributions in his career. And I was really impressed with that. I thought that was a really mature sort of decision and also wise. We want those who are leading kind of at an international level to really understand the systems that they're sort of helping guide the management of. And he has certainly done that over the last number of years and taken kind of this goal of his to task. Um, he has been a student who has expressed supreme dedication to his work. He's taken a lot of tough classes to build the skill set that you're going to see on display here, ranging from hydrology and ecology, ecology and geospatial analysis and statistics. And he's leaving with a skill set that's far more advanced than mine. And that's a mark of a great student. Um, and he also, you know, proved his field grit. He traveled to Costa Rica. He rode through croc crocodile infested marshes on horseback to collect his data. And I think he really built his street cred as a field ecologist in his time here as well. And all along the way, he's built a sort of a network of collaborators that are in diverse in their disciplines and in their backgrounds and the nationalities that they come from. And also sort of marked his kind of capabilities as a sort of a contribute, you know, as an academic and as a scientist in, in through this kind of network of collaborations. And I think you're going to see that on a full display today as well. Um, and I guess just kind of all the way through this degree program that I've, you know, kind of walked side by side with Stefano in, I have just been so impressed with his exceptional level of professionalism. He is always pushing the boundaries on what needs to be done next. Um, he's taken the lead on all of his work with a lot of maturity and, um, and sort of grit on learning new skills and being kind of undeterred about um, taking on um, new challenges. And I think in many ways, he set a bar for my other students that is really unfair <laughs> to expect them to uh, sort of uh, reach. I mean, Stefani, you've been the easiest student to mentor of all of mine, as much as I love, uh, love all of my students and their unique challenges in terms of day in and day out, bringing it to the table and, and doing your work with no complaints and with a lot of enthusiasm and maturity. I mean, just end to end, been just fantastic to work with. So thank you um, for taking me on the journey with your work over the last number of years. It's been an absolute pleasure to see you grow technically and professionally over these last number of years. And I can't wait to see what you're gonna do as you go back into the policy arena um, armed with the even broader skill set that you have today. So with that, um, please um, enjoy giving your exit seminar today and um, I'll, I'll leave it with that. So all the best, Stefano. Thank you so much for the very kind and generous introduction, uh, Christine. It's been great working in, in your lab and um, the biocomplexity lab also at Agriculture and Biological Engineering these past few years. And yes, I'm happy to present my work to everyone today. So I'm going to talk about ecosystem restoration as a nature-based solution in the case of an endangered wetland of international importance in Costa Rica. So first things first, what is ecosystem restoration in the context of wetlands? 
Ecological restoration is the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been damaged, degraded, or destroyed. As the disruption to the ecosystem, it's assisted recovery, it may need to target ecosystem structure and composition, but also ecosystem functionality. So structure and composition have more to do with the condition of the ecosystem. Functionality has more to do with the delivery of benefits that both wildlife and we as people enjoy. In the case of wetlands, the single most important characteristic to define this type of ecosystem is the hydro period or hydro pattern. That is the seasonal pattern of water levels to be maintained or restored for characteristic wetland soil and vegetation to reflect uh, those flooded conditions. The rationale for ever more convincingly promoting wetland restoration these days stems from the state of the world's freshwater ecosystems and the doubly dim statistic, which reports that we have now descended to 30% of all freshwater dependent species now being threatened, and about 30% also of all inland wetlands being lost between 1970 uh, and 2015. Undeniably, this raises huge concerns and expectedly poses even bigger challenges. The need and urgency are eerily similar to the ones felt at COP26 in Glasgow, uh, but the voices and strategies are less amplified, even though they are definitely as critical and quite fundamentally linked to climate action. As Tickner and others have recently proposed, uh, an emergency recovery plan needs to be put into effect if you want to bend the trajectory of the global freshwater biodiversity loss that we are experiencing. And that plan hinges on restoring habitat, connectivity and flows among other actions. The opportunity and the momentum to roll out this emergency recovery plan for freshwater biodiversity are emphasized by the United Nations. 2021-2030 has been declared the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. In conjunction, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, have developed a standard on nature-based solutions to also clarify the concept. This standard now reframes ecological restoration as an ecosystem-based approach, like several others, to achieving societal challenges, but how we actually carry out restoration projects that realize both human well-being and biodiversity benefits at the same time remains unclear. Uh, is that restoring ecosystem function, restoring ecosystem structure, or both? Given the scale and speed of the crisis, however, we can't clearly just be sitting there doing a wetland restoration project at the time and ways to find out weight of our own volition for converging results on these two fronts, or because of roadblocks such as lack of finance or lack of knowledge uptake by management. And that includes monitoring of results longer term. What mechanism does already exist that can be leveraged in terms of freshwater science and practice? The Ramsar Convention offers an existing policy framework to identify research needs in wetland management. This is a global convention that designates over 2,000 wetland sites around the world, which are all considered of international importance. Key tenets of the convention are uh, to avoid or control change in ecological character, aka degradation, perform and promote wise use of wetlands, aka manage its natural resources for their preservation as well as its use by people, and securing the water requirements of wetlands, aka the hydro pattern. One such Ramsar site is found in Northwest Costa Rica at the confluence of the mouths of the Tempisca and Bevedero rivers. There is a system of hydrologically separate wetlands that enjoy different levels of protection. Some from being designated as part of the Ramsar site only in blue, some as part of the predating same name national park in green. The Tempisca Bevedero watershed has also seen an interbasin water transfer from Lake Arenal lead to both hydropower generation and large scale irrigation uh, agriculture as the extensive network of canals testifies. And this makes it a complex uh, socio-ecological system that is studied by a broader project led by UF Water Institute that, that my research has been part of. What is notable about Palo Verde is that the wetlands have been put on an endangered site list by the Ramsar Convention since 1993. And this is mostly due to an ongoing invasion of southern cattle or typha. 
While invasions are not at all an uncommon conditions of wetlands, it also makes Palo Verde an informative system to study wetland restoration options, even more so considering that solutions to contain invasive vegetation have included historically cattle grazing and more recently crushing and drowning of taifa by tractors. And this creates openings that are particularly populated by water birds, which are the reason why the Ramsar site exists in the first place. But this is also a strategy that deals with the symptoms of wetland degradation and not with the likely legacy of underlying causes. Thinking back about wetland restoration as a nature-based solution to societal challenges, three tiers of implementation barriers have guided my research goals. First, they need to define and then monitor wetland restoration objectives and do this with tools like species distribution models, which can help you understand what you need to restore for. Second, they need to manage progress in wetland restoration across land uses and ecosystem services. And this is beyond the boundaries of the protected area being degraded, which can help you understand uh, what you restore with or against. Third, they need to incentivize multi-sectoral action as an enabling mechanism for wetland restoration. And this is again beyond the boundaries of the protected area, which can help you understand who you should restore with. As such, the focus of my research has been on the kind of interlinked science needed to inform management decisions for wetland restoration. And the three chapters I'm about to present to you reflect that focus as they deal with ecological dynamics, number one as these relate to landscape patterns in the watershed, number two, as these relate to watershed governing processes, number three. So in a way, my dissertation is also intended to form a roadmap uh, to help others apply our findings to wetland management beyond, again, the park boundaries. So in my first chapter, specifically, we focused on the effect of wetland hydro pattern and vegetation growth on the abundance of certain water bird species of conservation value, as well as all water bird species found in the park. Within this first chapter, we set out to explore what variables exactly can predict water birds for the area designated as the Palo Verde Ramsar site. We did that knowing from literature that both hydro pattern and vegetation growth have been found to be highly correlated with bird presence and abundance. Then we explored what combination of these metrics best predict uh, the abundance of different water birds, as well as several bird community indices. Different combinations of these metrics have been used before as predictors of animal abundance and diversity, but neither in a non-linear model, but based on relatively long high frequency time series of environmental conditions. Finally, we asked if the resulting species distribution model could be used as a novel approach to measuring change in the ecological character of any wetland, which is the management-oriented research question for this part of the research. But what kind of metrics are we talking about in practice? We said that hydro pattern describes the times of the year when the wetlands are flooded. In Palo Verde, the climate is highly seasonal in terms of rainfall, so that is reflected in wetland extent that shrinks considerably from wet to dry season. Two options we had for hydro pattern uh, are based on the ecology of water birds, but also on the data collection method. Surface water depth, which is what matters to both wading and diving birds, is measured by instruments installed and monitored remotely by UF Agriculture and Biological Engineering Department. Wetland extent can be measured by means of a wetness status index calculated on satellite imagery uh, and expressed as the fraction wet on a scale from zero to one of each sub wetland of the Palo Verde system. For vegetation growth, we also calculated uh, and mapped our third predictor on satellite imagery. NGVI is a common spectral index used to measure the greenness of vegetated land covers. Mean NDVI indicates that we use the spatial average for each sub wetland, just like fraction wet. Also similar to hydro pattern, vegetation greenness peaks sometime during the end of the wet season around November and reverses back to low valleys through May until which the rains essentially stop in Palo Verde. A lot of litter is produced as a result of these cycles and there used to be two originally distinct plant communities that are now made more similar by the persistence of cattle. For our response variables, we selected five species of water birds of high conservation value based on the designation criteria for the Ramsar site. These are two species of waterfowl in the smaller circles and three species of large waders in the uh, bigger circles. 
We obtained their abundance values from standardizing um, counts of citizen science observations. These were sightings of birds from the most visited sub-wetland, which had been recorded on the open online platform eBird. As a separate response variable, we also considered the abundance of all 60 species of water birds, most commonly found in Palo Verde. Among these, the most abundant species is the one in uh, the central circle, the black-bellied whistling duck. Here are some examples of those other 60 water-dependent bird species. And because some species occur in very low numbers, we adopted three diversity indices that would capture both evenness of community and if a particular species is dominant, like I said, is the case of the black-bellied whistling duck. These three metrics complete the response variables in our analysis, which was carried out in the Palo Verde sub-wetland at first. Uh, this highlighted here at the center with the orange color for the resulting model to be later recalibrated and expanded to all 10 sub-wetlands found in the uh, Ramsar site. So back to our first study objective and science-oriented question for chapter one. What are relevant predictors of water birds based on wetland hydro pattern and vegetation greenness? Like I mentioned, uh, previous studies have worked at the regional or national level, but always as linear regressions uh, or on, on ecosystems other than freshwater, such as forests or marine. Uh, we compiled, curated, and analyzed uh, the three original predictors I just presented as a nine year time series to check that their statistical properties that allowed used in a non parametric model. All three time series expectedly displayed seasonality um, with further used breaks analysis on the trend component to check for stationarity of conditions. And we later discovered that the break we detected towards the end of 2015 was associated with, you know, in fact, a recorded drought in the area. Because of this discovery in the properties of the time series, we transformed all three metrics. This was to check if the one conditional standard deviation of the daily rating change of their values uh, could also work as a good predictor. And we can call that transform fraction wet metric, which essentially represents its temporal fluctuations, uh, rate of change in wetting for short. Um, in the end, the combination between this metric and mean and DVI came out as the best combination of predictors. So we show here how their values display both a uh, wet, dry seasonal distribution and a uh, prior to post break distribution. The second science relevant question for chapter one was what is the relative importance of these metrics in predicting both avian abundance and diversity? Or in other words, what variable best predicts water bird abundance and diversity? The answer to which is vegetation greenness. And we were able to find that out by running generalized additive models or GAMS as the nonlinear regression in this analysis. Each group of response variables with their appropriate distribution and ranking variables relative importance by the significance of their smooth terms, which is a key element of GAMS. This finding confirms what previous studies had qualitatively described as the effects of vegetation, water depth, and even the rate of wetting of wetlands on water birds although these studies had never ranked them as predictors. On to the more management relevant question. Can we now measure change in the ecological character of a wetland with the species distribution model used to rank predictors? And this is linking back to the overall goal for this dissertation to overcome implementation barriers for wetland restoration when it comes to defining and monitoring what you restore for. To answer the more specific question, can the best combination of these predictors be used as a species distribution model? We tested nine combinations of the predictors found relevant by eliminating those with collinearity. And we found that the GAM with a multiplicative interaction between NDVI and the rate of change in wetting, shown in red in the table, was the best predictor for seven out of nine of our, our response variables. We consequently adopted this as the baseline model to estimate monthly predictions for total water bird abundances in the Palo Verde sub-wetland. And these thermal looking maps show the abundance and diversity indices of water birds for every possible pair of these two environmental conditions. Of note, uh, black-bellied whistling ducks in the top right panel 
appear to affect total species abundance and diversity, which are the bottom four panels. And uh, from these maps, we also glean that most species uh, together or individually are most abundant when mean NDVI is average and the rate of change in wetting is highest, which is a sign of hydrological instability that we most commonly observe in the late dry season. When looking at the wetland system as a whole, uh, and we did this to calibrate and validate the species distribution model, we found that monthly averages are confidently quantified for seven out of 10, the sub wetlands. And panel A shows the differences in average total water bird abundances across the site. And this confirms that the overall diversity of the wetland system is key to support uh, avian populations during the dry season and in the face of the cattle invasion. We also found that the role of breaks analysis in creating meaningful subsets of data was important to uncover a couple of significant changes in the avian popul populations. For example, that 53% fewer whistling ducks have been occurring during the wet season since after the 2015 drought. To bring it all together, what do these results mean for the science of ecological modeling? Well, overall, we found that vegetation greenness is a better predictor of both water bird abundance and diversity than wetland hydro pattern. Though the predicted capacity of vegetation greenness increases when combined with the metric used to measure temporal fluctuations in wetland extent. And in the process, uh, we also developed useful guidance for avian conservation in the context of wetland restoration. Uh, we developed a monitoring tool uh, for birds from relatively easy to obtain remote sense data, which really can be used for other wetlands in trouble around the world. We showed that change in the ecological character of a wetland, which is a Ramsar tenet, if you recall, can be detected from spatial temporal variability in water bird abundances. And we unpacked two complementary strategies for the park managers to consider. One to keep the core avian population were found in average numbers by focusing on maintaining stable environmental conditions and two, to boost the bird population were found in low numbers by reducing invasive plants during unstable hydrological events. So how to help reduce invasive plants? I dedicated my second chapter to looking into whether upstream croplands could have a role in aiding the process of mitigating the cattle invasion, specifically by analyzing the effect of different landscape patterns for two croplands on three select ecosystem services to understand where in the watershed that would be done best. Within this second chapter, we then set out to explore how water bird habitat quality, nitrogen retention and phosphorus retention vary over space and time. Then if trade-offs or synergies exist between these ecosystem services and how the strength of that interaction varies. Finally, we asked what is the relative importance of cropland composition, landscape configuration and hydrological connectivity on those trade-offs, which again is the management oriented research question for this part of the research. So we're back in that Tempisca watershed of Costa Rica. The two croplands in question are rice and sugarcane, for the three ecosystem services of interest, rice and sugarcane area are also threats, meaning that they have a negative association with them. A positive association between rice and an ecosystem service is possible though, which is water bird habitat. This is because birds feed on flooded rice paddies and a positive association is also possible between cattle and all three ecosystem services. And this is because cattle allow nutrient retention when present and water bird habitat when absent. So why is cropland composition important in this context? Well, rice and sugarcane farming do not require the same amount of nitrogen and phosphorus, not in terms of fertilizer load, nor in terms of the efficiency of the field uh, at retaining them. Uh, why is landscape configuration important? Because of these differences in retention capacity of rice and sugarcane, it may actually matter if one cropland drains into another cropland downstream. And why is hydrological connectivity important? because delivery of nitrogen and phosphorus to the different sub-wetlands in Palo Verde is going to depend on the sub-watershed they originate in, presumably. So a critical first step was to find out where rice and sugarcane have been in the watershed from year to year. To answer that question, we deployed a supervised land classification procedure in Google Earth Engine. 
where we use the random forest algorithm to classify five years of satellite imagery of land based on a mix of wet and green spectral indices and some 150 training points that we collected by driving around in the lower watershed and IDing three land cover classes, that is rice, sugarcane, and everything else like pasture, other crops, forest, built environment, and so on. This is a 2019 composite based on April images as the most distinctive month for the spectral indices we use to tell rice and sugarcane apart. To yield the average accuracy of 94% that this process did, we limited the classification exercise uh, to areas below 500 meters above sea level, which is where rice and sugarcane are found in the watershed, and also excluded wetland areas as inventoried by the Costa Rican government, which is why you see these holes in the map. Then because the ecosystem services in our study are calculated depending on cattail cover, we needed to find out where cattails have been growing in different sub-wetlands, provided that they go through uh, these cycles from every wet to dry season. So we use the same classification procedure as for rice and sugarcane, but for training points, we used higher resolution data from a preceding classification performed by partners at the Technical University of Denmark, the DTU. The higher resolution data they used came from a drone survey that we conducted together on a transect in the Palo Verde sub-wetland. So on the left are the vegetation covers as classified by DTU for the transect in 2018, which is what we used as the basis uh, to map cattails in the whole Palo Verde Ramsar site on the right uh, for the five years between 2015 and 2019. And thirdly, we deployed our own species distribution model from chapter one to predict total monthly abundances of water birds in the areas now classified as rice paddies. And we did that based on mean NDVI and the rate of change in wetting, which we recalculated for these new wetland areas. Another preliminary step was to delineate the 12 sub watersheds of the Tempisca that drain into the 10 Palo Verde sub wetlands in ArcGIS uh, hydro tool set. We used all this geospatial analysis in combination with uh, existing data sets from local literature, as well as other supporting chemical analysis that we conducted on the average nitrogen and phosphorus content of cattails in Palo Verde. And this was all to build the database required to run two models in the ecosystem service assessment tool called INVEST. The first model of habitat quality is parameterized with habitat suitability, which we related to total water bird abundances, habitat sensitivity, we related to cattle cover and distance to threat uh, rice and sugarcane areas in our case. And the second model nutrient delivery ratio is parameterized with nitrogen and phosphorus loadings and retention capacity, as well as a digital elevation model for each sub watershed to establish that hydrological connectivity between cells. Now back to our first study objective and science relevant question for chapter two. How does water bird habitat quality, nitrogen retention and phosphorus uh, retention vary over space and time? A few studies that actually incorporated this kind of uh, detailed sp spatial temporal information into ecosystem service modeling or trade-off analysis at the landscape scale. Information about the distribution of different cropland covers or about biomass uh, of invasive plant species in wetlands, uh, like we did instead. So, it is in this uh, knowledge vacuum that we generated annual maps for water bird habitat quality at the cell and sub watershed level. Sub watersheds with sub wetlands with high habitat quality in dark blue or a lot of rice area tend to also be dark blue at the aggregated scale. And uh, it is at this scale that we can best appreciate uh, variation from year to year. We didn't find the same variation in terms of the highest nitrogen retention as this was always associated with the same uh, sub watershed there at the center in, in, in blue. And here we can appreciate that uh, sub watersheds with sub wetlands with low nitrogen retention in dark red um, are somewhat offset by the sugarcane area that is highly efficient at retaining nitrogen, uh, which is in blue. Uh, the same is true for phosphorus retention, for which we also note that flooded rice paddies have a lower retention capacity for this nutrient compared to sugarcane 
for the rest of the land in the sub watershed. And it is again at this scale that um, we can appreciate variation from year to year. The second science relevant question for chapter two was uh, do trade offs or synergies exist between these ecosystem services and how does the strength of that interaction vary? Or in other words, are there strong trade offs between these ecosystem services? The answer to which we found is yes. Yes, in sub watersheds comprising enough cropland as well as wetland area. And hot spots and cold spots in this figure represent convergence of high and low delivery of ecosystem services. When two or more, high delivery suggests synergy, while low delivery is indicative of a trade off. Uh, true, true trade offs, however, are shown in shades of yellow and represent low delivery of at least one ecosystem service compared to what the value would be if we calculated for each single cell without landscape effects. And this is because it is otherwise uh, like comparing apples with oranges when bundling high delivery of two completely different ecosystem services together. And the answer to whether those trade offs are significantly strong is also yes but only between nitrogen and phosphorus retention over the entire period of analysis. And the reason being that these nutrients are not retained with the same efficiency, neither in croplands where retention depends on the type of crop, uh, nor in wetlands where retention depends on the stage of cattle invasion. Such work that this study weaves together is critical to inform efforts to manage invasive vegetation in wetlands that otherwise tend to fail when they don't address exogenous sources of nutrients. Hence, the management relevant question for chapter two, what is the relative importance of cropland composition, landscape configuration and hydrological connectivity on ecosystem service trade-offs, which is also linking back to the overall goal for this dissertation to overcome implementation barriers for wetland restoration when it comes this time to identifying and leveraging additional drivers across the landscape. While addressing this question about landscape patterns, we also set out to confirm uh, a working hypothesis that would make configuration the key landscape metric. The hypothesis is that rice paddies may buffer nutrient loads from sugar um, cane croplands into the wetlands when these rice paddies are bordering sugar cane fields. Uh, operationally, we answered the question of what correlation there is between each landscape metric and ecosystem service. And to find that rice area draining um, adjacent sugarcane area indeed has a significant effect on increasing phosphorus retention. Q and Turner before us had found similar results for landscape configuration flooding land covers. They, however, didn't find it for rice and phosphorus specifically like we did. And when we unveiled this positive correlation at the scale of the three main tributaries of the Tempisca, Vedero, and Canyons rivers, uh, we also ranked these groupings of um, sub watersheds. And as the graphs show, every other correlation between any of the three landscape metrics and either ecosystem service delivery or trade off, uh, we found to be negative. So what does this all mean for the science of ecosystem service modeling? Well, first we found that the percentage of rice area draining uh, adjacent sugarcane area is a significant effect on increasing phosphorus retention at the sub watershed level. And this means that more rice buffers, the smaller the trade-offs in phosphorus retention at this scale. The secondly, we found that both rice configuration and total rice area relative to sugarcane, which is the landscape composition metric, have a significant effect on decreasing water bird habitat quality. And this means that the more rice in general, the greater the trade offs in phosphorus um, in habitat, uh, water bird habitat quality. In the process, again, we developed uh, useful guidance for cattle management this time in the context of wetland restoration. And uh, we developed a monitoring tool for invasive plants from relatively easy to obtain spectral indices that can be replicated elsewhere. Uh, we also showed that change in cattle dependent ecosystem service trade-offs or wise use in Ramsar terms, if you recall, can be detected from spatial temporal variability in ecosystem service delivery. Finally, again, we unpacked two complementary strategies for watershed stakeholders to consider this time. 
to increase buffering rice area for sugar cane in select sub watersheds, specifically to increase it where the water burden habitat quality trade off is high, but the phosphorus retention one is low, uh, and that's in overly invaded sub wetlands, or to do it where the water burden habitat quality trade off is low, but the phosphorus retention one is high, and that's in relatively uninvaded sub wetlands. So in order to study how to deal with the other factor controlling bird populations, the hydro pattern, I dedicated my last chapter to exploring how building science management partnerships can help secure environmental water of seasonally ponding wetlands like Palo Verde. In this first chapter, we looked at how these environmental water requirements are determined, then at what institutional entities as opposed to actors such as nature conservation organizations initiate this determination, Finally, we investigated what other actors need to be involved in the process of knowledge generation and uptake. And this is key to support the actual allocation of environmental water and related management decisions to come. So what is environmental water to begin with? Environmental water is the amount, timing and quality of water flows required to sustain fresh water and estuarine ecosystems, as well as the human livelihoods and well-being that depend on these ecosystems. For example, the freshwater reaching estuarine areas where mangroves grow and need that certain balance in terms of salinity, sediments and even temperature to grow healthy. In the case of bodies of standing water, we talk about environmental water to refer not just to inflows from streams, but also flood water from runoff or seepage emerging from the ground. The management of environmental water can be broken down into four key steps. Step of determining, allocating, implementing, and managing environmental water. And the distinction between active and passive management is in who is legally in charge of the environmental water allocation on behalf of the wetland in question whether a catchment authority or a wetland manager who can in turn be a park agency, a conservancy, or a private owner acting as a steward of the land. Uh, we have seen at the onset of this talk how Palo Verde is a wetland that floods and dries up seasonally. Now, these wetlands are complex ecosystems because they are transitionally between aquatic and terrestrial. As such, they are associated with two different sets of ecosystem services for each season. And the advantage of looking at this subset of freshwater ecosystems is that drier regions of the world usually need to develop additional capacity to overcome the flexibility in management and decision making required, which is something imposed by the higher variability in water available. And capacity is developed, however, if the financial resources are there, because the transaction costs of developing additional frameworks are also higher. And on the other hand, this likely makes these changes in governance more apparent. Another seasonally ponding wetland I got familiar with through my personal involvement with the Mediterranean Wetland Initiative, MedWet, is Laguna de Gallo Canta in Spain. This is a saline lake found in a closed inland catchment that local colleagues have been studying, specifically to determine the environmental water requirements of the different plant communities growing at a certain distance from the shore. These communities are classified and coded with a specific habitat number by the European Union, and the extent with which they occur has been fluctuating a lot uh, over time, along with the lake size, which speaks to the high variability found in these, in these systems. So for this chapter, we then identified two more case studies in Mexico and Morocco that were also selected because of what they have in common, which is climate, the presence of a seasonally ponding wetland within a larger watershed or river basin, and respectively in pairs by region, a similar trajectory of institutional development for water resources management, a similar ratio in GDP differences, and country membership to their respective uh, Ramsar regional initiatives. To further unpack the first step of determining environmental water, we used process tracing, which is a method employed in theory of change studies to evaluate the effects of project interventions. As we did that, we came to focus on the first two sets of activities for case study analysis, where we tested whether failure to adopt a broader framework was at the source of the limited number of successful implementations of environmental water worldwide. 
Specifically, we looked at what allows moving from recognizing and understanding all actors and challenges involved in a potential reallocation of environmental water to convening and facilitating dialogue for joint visioning in the watershed. Our unpacking of the individual processes involved in effective environmental water management follows the blueprint of another concept or approach that is key to understanding this chapter, which is benefit sharing. This is an alternative and inclusive approach to the negotiation of shared waters that does away with zero sum games over a single finite resource. Instead of focusing on volumes of water, benefit sharing focuses on all direct and indirect benefits stemming from improved water management of the resource, including cooperation. In a benefit sharing framework, benefits do not all include consumptive uses such as irrigation agriculture and to an extent hydropower generation, but also benefits returned by a healthy wetland in terms of domestic water supply, fisheries, and tourism, as in the case of the boat tours in the Tempisco River estuary that need a certain average flow to operate safely. To articulate its application to the environmental water management process, we followed the methodology that has been developed by IUCN as I was initially involved in that effort. In line with this analytical framework, our first study objective and science relevant question for chapter three was, how are environmental water requirements for seasonally spawning wetlands determined? And while challenges with environmental flow implementation have been studied quite extensively, uh, very few have specifically focused on these temporary standing water ecosystems. Uh, so more specifically, did something in the biophysical system hinder the environmental water determination process? And we found that all four locations in our case studies had conducted assessments in the past, which, we, which suggest that the scientific capacity is at, at least there. However, when you have both these conditions of ecological complexity and hydrological variability, monitoring networks are also required to assess the productivity of the environmental water in terms of biodiversity and ecosystem services for people. And this is to guarantee ad that adaptive management of environmental water because uh, trade-offs in benefits tend to be, become apparent over time through the negotiation step or after implementation. So the establishment of monitoring networks is something that we um, only saw happen in Mexico and Spain. Second science relevant question, what institutional entities or actors initiate this determination? This is hardly ever studied from the point of view of institutional or actor network theories and, or in what pertains to the socioeconomic system in general. So did the socioeconomic system hinder the determination process? Again, we found that all our four locations experienced uh, adequate levels of sectoral participation that suggests that uh, the governance capacity and different managerial expertise required to implement environmental water is at least there. However, if you still have inflexibility and inequity in, in institutions, that doesn't allow for ecosystem services provided by the environmental water to be valued by all beneficiaries. So the actual allocation may be negotiated but never executed because it's incomplete and conflictual, which is what we saw happen in Mexico. Horn and others argued as well that environmental water allocations need to encompass ecosystem benefits beyond the mere volume of water, but they didn't propose a practical approach to achieving its negotiation and implementation like uh, we did for our analysis. The work that this last study weaves together is also critical to inform efforts to incentivize multi-sectoral action for wetland restoration beyond the park agency that otherwise tend to fail when they do not involve other potential beneficiaries of this environmental water reallocation. And uh, this is linking back to the overall goal for my dissertation to overcome implementation barriers when it comes to identifying and working with who uh, you should restore the wetland with. Hence, the management relevant question for chapter three, what other actors need to be involved in the knowledge generation and uptake processes to support future environmental water allocation and management? And to answer this last question, we use the evidence collected from the four case studies to confirm the working hypothesis that science management partnerships are essential to move from determination to reallocation of environmental water. 
This figure uh, summarizes how these partnerships work to align institutional flexibility and socioeconomic uh, equitability with the eco uh, hydrological complexity of the system. And these are the first and second challenge facing effective environmental water management. Benefit sharing at the center is the approach that underpins the conditions for overcoming the first challenge with matching scientific and managerial expertise. It is benefit sharing because it operationalizes recognition of the multiple values of environmental water for both people and ecosystems as we spoke. So the take home messages for this final chapter and my uh, dissertation overall are that on the knowledge generation side, tools like the species distribution model developed for chapter one can contribute to addressing the first challenge we described linked to hydrological variability and ecological complexity. Second, that the trade-off analysis like the one carried out for chapter two can help frame uh, restoration objectives as ecosystem services for socioeconomic equitability, while benefit sharing can help with uh, filling that gap in institutional flexibility, which is the second uh, challenge we described. And on the knowledge uptake side of my final message is the useful guidance we developed this time for environmental water management, again, the context of wetland restoration, uh, is to tie together the monitoring tools I've been talking about to assess both biodiversity and ecosystem services values, then to frame the environmental water requirements of wetlands, which was the last transfer tenant from the onset of my talk. So productive allocation objective where both these values are pursued. Finally, that in countries uh, where institutions such as river basin organizations are mandated by law, these institutions need to be supplemented by motivated actors which experience, with experience and skill to negotiate allocation and adapt and management of environmental water. And benefit sharing offers a suitable approach for doing just that. And with that, I would like to give huge thanks to all of those who made this work possible. My advisor, first and foremost, uh, Dr. Christina Angelini, my committee members, uh, the Uyghur faculty and my other fellows, my mates in the, the Angelini lab, SNRE of course, my academic partners at the University of Louvain in Belgium and of Denmark, biological station managers and the field staff at OTS in uh, Costa Rica. And are there any questions now or that you can email to me? Thank you. So Stefano, I can, there's a couple of questions in the, in the chat. I'm not sure if, um, if Ramesh is going to MC, I'll, I'll hand it over to him if he is. David, well, do you want to go ahead that, and ask your questions? Yeah, go ahead. Well, Rafa and I both have a chance to ask Stefano questions tomorrow, I believe. So maybe we could see if, if we could uh, fish for any questions from the other audience, because we'll grill you about hydro period and retention tomorrow. Um, so I'm, I'm willing to uh, table mine for now. Everyone's mind is just blown at the diversity and depth and breadth of what you presented to us in, in an hour, less than an hour. So, yeah, there was understandably uh, a lot. <laughs> and there's a lot probably exactly in the um, cracks or the weeds or the nuts and bolts, <laughs> call it what as you will. Uh, All right, well, I'll just ask my question then and just to, to get rolling. So you said that greenness was the best predictor for the bird abundance in, in chapter one. And but it, all the work I've done, I find this, of course, negative correlation between greenness and, and wetland hydrology. The wetter the wetland, the more open water, the lower the NDVI. And so you're explicitly tested for extent and hydro pattern, but you find greenness as this um, ultimate predictor. And did you control for or eliminate collinearity between wetted extent and greenness, which are generally negatively correlated? Yes, no, thanks for that question, David. Um, there was a lot of um, um, the analysis that went into checking for uh, stationarity of those time series uh, and, uh, and, and subsequently collinearity that led to uh, first transforming um, uh, all the three, um, the, the two hydro pattern and what in the MDVI metric and um, and then also um, 
did um, uh, com convergent cross mapping uh, analysis to see that they they're actually they pair quite they're quite uh, well correlated in this uh, system. Uh, so yeah, in terms of transferring, you know the applicability of uh, using mean NTVI, you know, alone to predict water birds uh, everywhere else. I think the value here is that um, um, it's in the, 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 the combination with, um, with this uh, rate of change in wetting as we call it in short, that it was this uh, transformation by GART model to fraction wet. Um, so I, I, I mean, I can speculate on what <laughs> leads to abundances in the balance between uh, uh, too much vegetation or um, open, um, open water areas in, in this wetland. Um, and yeah, how that, to what extent that applies uh, elsewhere. And uh, if, like I mentioned there, there's been studies that have been um, uh, using these kinds of predictors, but um, not really, mo mostly the regional level. So not diving down into, on, you know, into a uh, local wetland example. Um, yeah, so there's that. That's good for now. I'll ask you some more questions tomorrow. Well, perhaps since you started uh, with the with that one, let me ask you then a complementary question, which is, what what else is in the NDVI signal beyond the potential collinearity that David was mentioning? Because that will help you understand why they might or might not be totally collinear or correlated to each other. Um, so certainly one aspect of the response might be the hydro period or the or, or or the wetland extent, but there is more there. So what else is uh, embedded into the NDVI signal that might not be collinearly correlated with the multi-collinearly correlated with the water? In the NDVI signal, yeah. um, well, there's probably temperature. There's a uh, uh, I mean, as in terms of. Um, uh, we didn't look in, at uh, evapotranspiration, but the system uh, is going to result from that balance. The, the, the point I was trying to make is that um, because the, they are, because of the collinearity with uh, simple fraction wet, the, the, the combination of predictors that, that we used were, were at the end was uh, the transformed one, which uh, was dealing with the collinearity problem. But to answer uh, your question, Rafa, um, um, what else is there? Um, well, there's some some management, uh, probably. Uh, though, to what extent that would be reflected at the scale of the whole sub wetlands, I'm not sure. Um, and I can think of anything else right now. Right, uh, you, you probably remember uh, <clears throat> one of the Alice's papers that there is an overall trend to greening in this region, outside the wetland, including, you know, uh, so there are other factors that might contribute to that vegetation change beyond just the wetland component. And I think that's compounded on top of uh, that response to water. So I perhaps refresh what might be embedded into NDVI for tomorrow, then we can continue the discussion. Yeah, 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 no, for sure. I mean, the second chapter sort of uh, delves into mechanisms that lead to cattle invasion. So uh, you they can probably list everything from salinity to uh, to how litter is produced and, 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 and biogeochemistry of, of the whole system. So, okay. It looks like Wendell Cooper or Cropper has a maybe has a question. Yeah, um, thanks. It was a very interesting talk. I was impressed by the the range of approaches you decided to uh, address this with. But one of the sort of one of the fundamental things I wonder about is, 
you have a bunch of drivers that vary a lot over both space and time. And uh, how much do, do your model results depend on the history of what happened before you started looking at the data? You know, you, uh, if you have a lot of phosphorus loading before you first start looking at it, is that different than if you don't? Um, if you have a period of droughts and then you start analyzing the data versus a period of high rainfall. Um, so how confident are you that history hasn't confounded your, your modeling? Yeah, no, thanks a lot for that question. I should have added that um, I was very conscious uh, of everything going on, including in, in, you know, in the past, and I wasn't going to address, you know, unravel all the sort of uh, the causes behind uh, what's been driving the cattle invasion. Uh, as I hope it came across from my talk, I was also very much um, concerned with um, producing tangible results for with with, with these tools. That uh, and and uh, I think I, I sort of touched on some of the you know that. Um, what workable models can can be uh, uh, developed with um, uh, information that uh, is relatively easy to obtain, but there's uh, by no means trying to explain uh, the you know the the bigger drivers so uh, type of causes behind uh, uh, the um, the cattle invasion, for example, because. Uh, uh, they've been trying for years, and <laughs> I mean, there's a lot more research that needs into measuring uh, nutrients all around. Uh, so, yeah, I don't uh, expect my research to be taken, you know, beyond what it actually is, which is, you know, this snapshot we we measure, you know, uh, with 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 uh, with. Um, uh, right um, uh, limitations uh, uh, expressed and, uh, and 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 that's um, and and then offering sort of these tools also to for park management yeah for for what it's worth i mean I, your suggestions and and recommendations all seem to make sense but um would would you have said think uh, something very different if you hadn't done all the modeling exercises <laughs> well I don't know what you're referring to in particular, but the the park doesn't really, uh, you know, know how many birds they should uh, manage uh, sub wetlands for, or nobody's really uh, thinking about reconfiguring agriculture in the watershed because nobody's really made uh, uh, concrete, uh, tangible connections between uh, these parts of the system. So to me, that was a good place to start. There's a difference between managing the number of birds, a population um, criteria, and um, trying to, to restore wetlands to promote better bird habitat. <laughs> I mean, surely they, they have an idea of what they need to do to make better bird habitat. <laughs> uh, well, in part, I believe, I mean, um, at the same time, the, 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 the basis is the requirement from the, you know, the designation of the site and, uh, and, and that is uh, bird numbers. How do you link it to bird habitat is left to park managers, doesn't stay in the convention. So that's, that's where the discussion can uh, begin yeah, with. Them. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm sure you, they are appreciative of all the work you did. I'm, I, it probably does help them a lot, so. It is a very nice presentation, a lot of good stuff. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Thanks a lot.